Please take a moment to pause the video and reread this problem before listening on. In this question, we have two different kinds of fields at work. We have a uniform electric and uniform magnetic fields, both of which are present. And because we have two kinds of fields and a charged particle moving through them, then this charged particle is going to experience two different kinds of forces. It's going to experience a magnetic force as defined by this equation, as well as an electric force given by this equation. We're going to begin by analyzing the magnetic force acting on this electron. And if we look at the equation for the magnetic force, we can see that it involves a cross product between the velocity and the magnetic field. So let's take a look at how we can set that cross product up. So we put the charge on the outside of this cross product setup, if you will. And then what we have are I hat, J hat, and k hat, and as a reminder, that just corresponds with the x, y, and z directions. Now in the cross product, the velocity comes first. So what we're gonna do is fill in the x and y and z components of the velocity. So take a look at the velocity vector given right here. You can see that there is no i hat component, no x component. So for that velocity, we're just gonna put zero. But for the j hat or y component, we have 12 and that's kilometers per second. So that's gonna be 12,000 meters per second. We'll omit units for clarity right now. And then for the k hat or z component, we have 15,000 meters per second. So we fill in the velocity components first because the velocity comes first in the cross product. Next, we move over to the magnetic field. And the magnetic field only has an I hat or X component. It's 400 micro Teslas. So what we'll do for the X component of the magnetic field is we will write 400. And because it's in micro Tesla, we have to multiply that by 10 to the minus sixth to get it into Tesla. The other two components are both zero. So this is the setup, and what we're now going to do next is actually compute this cross product. Now to do that, we're going to fill in the charge Q of an electron. And that is the standard unit of charge on the electron. Now what we're going to do is set up what I like to call a cross product template. So for a cross product template, we're going to leave a little space here for our I hat or x direction, then we put a minus sign, then we need another space for j hat, and then a plus sign, and then a final space for k hat, or the z component. I think this might have come off the screen a little bit, so let me slide it over. And now the question is, how do we fill in these little gaps or these little spaces that we've left? So let's start with i hat, and to compute the little value in the space here, what you do is you go to the i hat in your table and you imagine that you cross it off. So we're actually gonna cross that i hat off and then what we do, there we go, then what we do is take the remaining two columns and we basically calculate what's called a determinant. A determinant is just a cross multiplication procedure, essentially. So what you do is you cross multiply this way, so 12,000 times zero, that's zero, and then you cross multiply the other way, 15,000 times zero, which is also zero, and then you subtract those two outcomes. Now, of course, zero minus zero is zero, so we can see that there's not going to be any magnetic force component in the x direction. So now we go back and clean things up, and then we want to fill in the j hat. And similarly, then, we're going to cross off the j hat column, just like that, I don't know why that automatically disappears. But anyways, now we would do the cross multiplication procedure. We're gonna do zero times zero, which is zero. So we'll put a little bracket here because of that minus sign. And then we do cross multiplication the other way. I'm gonna pick up my calculator and multiply those two. And I get six. And then we subtract those two outcomes. So zero minus six is negative six. So that's gonna be a little negative six in the space, but because we have that subtraction, we're subtracting a negative six. So that actually becomes a plus and then a six right there. Very nice. Now we're going to compute the final little space here for k hat. We're gonna cover up k hat just like that. And it again, automatically disappears. That's wonderful. So now we're gonna cross multiply. We're gonna do zero times zero which of course is zero. And then we'll cross multiply those two quantities. That's a 12,000 right there. And we end up with 4.8. And then we subtract those two, zero minus 4.8. That'll give us a negative 4.8. 
Okay, now don't forget that you still have this charge Q on the outside. We would have to distribute that. For simplicity, instead of distributing this very awkwardly large number, I'm going to go back and just call this Q with a subscript E. That just represents the charge on an electron. We will see, I think, later that it won't actually matter to fill in the value. So for now, I'm not going to use the number. I'm just going to distribute QE into the brackets here so that we can rewrite the magnetic force as follows. And so there is the current representation of the magnetic force. Now, let's go back and recall that this electron was accelerating, and it was accelerating in the i hat, which is the x direction. Notice it's not accelerating in the y direction or in the z direction. And if it's not accelerating in the y or z directions, then the net force in those directions must be zero. Recall from Newton's second law, which basically says net force equals mass times acceleration. If you have zero acceleration in a particular direction, then you have zero net force in that direction. So again, no acceleration in the y and z direction. Therefore, there should be no net force in the y and z directions. Let's see how that helps us. So here's a little table that's kind of organizing the two forces. Remember, there was not just a magnetic force, but there's also an electric force present because there was an electric field present as well. We just claimed that the net force in the Y and Z directions were both zero, which means that the electric force must have a Y component of negative six times the charge of an electron, and then the Z component of the electric force must be positive 4.8 times the charge of an electron. Those must be true because, again, when we add those two forces in the Y direction, we get zero, and same thing in the Z direction. So that's pretty cool. Now, the only thing that we haven't figured out yet is the electric force in the x direction. But we can do that because we know that the electric force, and we'll just say in the x direction, equals the charge of the electron multiplied by the electric field in the x direction. You probably learned that equation in an earlier chapter. Now, in addition, in the x direction, we could set that equal to the mass of the electron multiplied by the acceleration in the x direction. So this is another expression of Newton's second law, where we have the F net equaling the MA. Now, we know the acceleration and the mass of an electron. We know the acceleration because it was given to us. It was 2 times 10 to the 12th meters per second squared. It said I hat, so that's the x direction. And we also know the mass of the electron. So we're going to plug those two values in for mass and acceleration. And then what we're going to do is solve for the electric field in the x direction. We can divide both sides by the charge of the electron, so we cancel it out on the left-hand side. We'll then fill in the numerical value for the charge of an electron, and then we're going to have the electric field in the x direction. Notice the charge is negative because it is an electron, and the electric field in the x direction turns out to be negative 11.4, and the standard unit here is newtons per coulomb. Now, this is great. This is part of our answer, but we still haven't figured out the electric field in the y direction or the z direction. We only currently have the electric force in those two directions. So we have a little bit more work ahead of ourselves, but it's not too bad. We know once again that the electric force in the y direction would equal the charge of the electron multiplied by the electric field in the y direction. And then we're going to write a similar equation for the z direction right over here. Now, Going to the y direction, remember the electric force in the y direction was negative 6 QE. So we would fill in negative 6 QE over here, and that equals QE times the electric field in the y direction. And here is that moment where the QEs did not need to be filled in, because if we divide both sides by QE, they actually cancel each other out. So after moving this down, we now see that the electric field in the y direction is negative 6 Newtons per coulomb. 
we're going to do something very similar for the z direction. We're going to fill in the electric force of positive 4.8 QE. That equals QE times the electric field in the z direction. Go ahead and cancel the QEs. And now you have the electric field acting in the z direction as well. So there's the y, here's the z, and then we also have the x somewhere down there. Let's just write it out in unit vector notation to give the final answer for this electric field. And there it is. The electric field present in this region of space based on all the given quantities is this right here in unit vector notation.